Hello and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program where we talk about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Kenya is often known as the cradle of humanity. Modern Kenya is an economic powerhouse. At the same time, there is high unemployment and more than 10 million Kenyans suffer from hunger. To tell us more about this apparent contradiction and the situation of Catholics in Kenya, it is my very great privilege to welcome His Eminence Cardinal John Njue, the Archbishop of Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, Your Eminence, and thank you for being with us here today in our program. Thank you. Your Eminence, you were born in a family of 12 in the Embu region. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the circumstances of your youth? Well, I, uh, as it is known, uh, when I was born, of course, I found myself in uh, this family. And um, it was not the easiest of the situation because my father was very, uh, very tough. Strict. He was a disciplinarian, let's put it that way. Um, but um, myself, I uh, wanted to be a little bit, a little bit uh, free. And uh, but nevertheless, you know, I came to a point whereby I realized that I didn't have uh, much alternative, but I had to toe the line. Mm. In fact, my father was so tough that I used to hear him cough at the entrance, and I would go under the bed. Wow. Because I didn't know uh, whether he was coming with a spirit of peace or uh, uh, whatever. So, and then I would see if there was no problem, I would begin coughing just to say that I was around. And they would tell me to come out and life would kind of go life, on. Life would continue. So on. Yes. Um, otherwise, I, I, I then was given the work to grace the cows. And I enjoyed it because I really used to milk the cows in the in the bush. And when mm, the cows came back, they tried to milk them, but there was no milk, and so on. And that went on until then. My father, in 1952, decided that I was going to school, but I was not very comfortable because I was wondering whether there was milk in the school. And really, I never I never studied, I never learned because I was disappointed until uh, in November 1952 when the exams came, I refused to go because I mean, what was I going to do and so on. I entered my father's house and I found that he had hanged some meat. I cut a big piece, roasted it and ate it and I was so satisfied. But my father had gone through the school and was told that your son never came to school. So he found me there at home, and, and uh, of course uh, he was very conscious that I could escape. So he just told me, I have a jigger here, can you come and remove it? When I went to bow down, he got hold of me, and he beat me, and then he left me there, and my mother came, and she took some leaves, put them on the fire, put them on me, and then my mother told me, son, I would not like to lose you, and not when you are so small. And if you don't want me to lose you, then do what your father is telling you. 1953, I was the first to appear in school. And I learned and never looked back. When did you have a sense of your vocation? It was actually in 1953. So soon? Yes, 1953, I was in class one, and I was going to school. And that was a time for the uh, uh, Liberation War. Uh, it was called Mau Mau. And so the people were fighting in order to have independence from Britain. And um, at a particular moment on the way, 
I found a man who was really crucified on the ground. And he was, I think, almost dying. And my, uh, I remember that the, the priest had told us, if you see anyone who is uh, close to dying, then come and call us so that we can anoint him. But the distance from there to the parish was over 20 miles. And so, and then those days, if you missed the school, the following day, you would be beaten very badly. So I preferred to go to school. But then as I was going, something was, uh, you know, uh, deep in me. If I were a priest, I would have done what the priest was supposed to do. And that never left me. And so when they were asking us in the class, the teacher was asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always used to write, I want to be a priest. And uh, so in 1960 is when uh, I was coming from another school, intermediate, and I met the teacher who really uh, was asking us those questions. And he tells me, you boy, I thought you said you wanted to be a priest. And I said, yeah. You know, tomorrow there is an interview. And uh, so do you want to go? I said, well, yeah. So he gave me a note to my father. And my father uh, then asked somebody to take me. I went for the interview. I didn't know even what an interview is. And I sat in front of the priest for the interview. It was oral. It was my first time to sit, you know, face to face. And, and there he was asking me, you know, questions about the seminary. I did not know what seminary was all about. How, how many years does one stay in the seminary? Did I know? So he asked me so many questions. I answered not even one of them. Then finally he asked me, but do you want to be a priest? Then I looked at him and I said, eh, what? Do you want to be a priest? I said, oh, yeah, yeah. That was the end of the interview. <laughs> that was it. And uh, two, I mean, two weeks later, I get a letter. Following your interview, I want to inform you that you passed. And your parents were happy? My father was happy. My mother was happy. And, and I went. Off you went? Yes. You were ordained a priest in St. Peter's yes. in 1973. Yes. And then again, you received your uh, beretta and uh, your ring from yes. Pope Benedict XVI, uh, in, again in St. Peter's. Yes. What emotions that must have been very strong to have received yes. both your priestly ordination and a cardinalate in the same place. The interesting thing is that um, um, myself and my 38 other classmates, we were ordained, well, even more, we were ordained deacons on the 3rd of January, 1973. And on the 6th of January, 1973, we were ordained priests by Paul the Sixth, And uh, it was a very powerful moment for me. In fact, when we were um, ordained, uh, I, I felt it touched me so much. I said, well, yes, this, um, the ordination for me is not a point of arrival, but is really a point of uh, departure in exercising a very important ministry that has, is, is uh, entrusted to me. And so I really was very happy to be ordained a priest again by the Holy Father. And then I remember when I was informed by the nuncio that I had been, uh, first of all, I was transferred from where I was as a coadjutor archbishop in Nyeri. And then uh, I was informed that um, I have been, uh, I have been uh, in, nominated oh, as a cardinal. That was actually 10 days later. And in fact, my question to the, the nuncio, when he told me the Holy Father has, uh, appoint, I mean, has appointed you as a, a cardinal, I said, who? I said, okay, so be it. And so the, 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 these are certain events in life that are very, 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 very uh, touching. And then when we were given the, 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 the ring and the, the biretta. biretta and so on, 
and reminding us once again what it means for us that well it is not uh, something that one can say that well yeah it is uh, something that one but one has it, achieved but yes. one as you say another point of departure yes and uh, that there you are to serve the church it is not going to be an easy uh, responsibility and that is why well it's yeah you may have to pour blood mm. and that's why then we are given the beretta in red and yes. so on yes yes the joy in in kenya was was tangible was overwhelming yes uh, the the largest circulation newspaper the daily nation said quote the appointment by pope benedict is not just an honor for the church but for the whole country and in nairobi spontaneous song and dance celebrations upon your arrival yeah. uh, created a two kilometer gridlock on a dual carriageway in what signs were these for you of the love for the church for their pastor I was very moved, really, because, uh, in fact, I told them uh, when we arrived at the airport and I told the people, yes, this is a great honor, not just to me, but I think to the whole country. And I asked them that, please, can we walk together? Can you remember me in your prayers? I want to come and address a little bit Kenya, the country itself. It's yes. an economic powerhouse in the region. Um, with, as I quote, some of the best infrastructure and communications networks and education systems in East Africa. Mm -hmm. And yet, at the same time, according to government statistics, most Kenyans live below the poverty level of one dollar a day. Yes. Why this dichotomy? Well, let's um, put it this way, that I think it all depends on the uh, uh, mode of uh, governance. And it depends also on the uh, uh, people that are there in the governance and, uh, and what their priorities really are. Does their leadership focus on the good of the citizens or does it focus on what they themselves can be able to uh, get? And I think this has been my, one of my points of insistence, that if we are talking of, uh, of our politics, we are really talking of a good, uh, good, governance. good governance. And when this is deviated, then automatically the fruits of that are seen in the situation of the, uh, of the people. Because when the people are not given what is really theirs, then automatically uh, the whole element of poverty begins to come in. And where there is poverty, then of course there cannot be real joy. So I, I think the biggest problem that we have heard in that country is the question of uh, the understanding of power. You know, so it's not just about commanding, but I think it is a question of servitude. Yeah. But that I think has not sunk. Not yet. It. And it's, we, are not, we are not yet there. And that is why then you find that, yes, you may find some uh, places which are very, very, very um, uh, poor, and that is where, again, the church has to kind of uh, pay attention to. Then you find other areas which are very um, elevated because for one, in one way or another, they may be benefiting yes. from the, the, system. the system. You have been an outspoken advocate. In fact, in 2002, you received death threats. Yes, I uh, did. Because you spoke out so strongly against corruption. Yes. Is this still an issue? Uh, is corruption still a cancer, as you say, in Africa? Yes. I think um, the corruption seems to have taken, uh, to have taken root in the, in the country. It's unfortunate. And um, I think the problem has been that um, maybe not much effort has been done in order to kind of uh, uh, put on systems that can help to check this uh, uh, question of, uh, of corruption. It's unfortunate because Kenya, to be very frank, I think is one of the most potential countries. Even if there are areas which are difficult because they are arid and so on, but if, if, if the systems were in place, those who have more, whatever they produce and so on, could very well be uh, shared. shared in one way or another. Because we say in my language, there is no place that does not have its own richness. No place that does not have its own richness. And I remember 
showing that to some of the people in one of the uh, dioceses where I was, where I told them, look, you do not ever, ever, ever cry out that, uh, you know, you are in a miserable area. You are also sitting on gold. So I think it's all a question of uh, um, uh, governance and which controlled governance and this can, I think, be able to reduce the whole issue of um, uh, corruption. I want to come back to this question of governance because Kenya has adopted recently a new constitution. Yes. And it seems there is much good. I would like to quote, uh, yes. the new constitution establishes a Supreme Court and an upper house of parliament. Yes. The position of the prime minister is abolished and a presidential system with checks and balances is retained and it contains a bill of rights. So there's much good news in the new constitution in exactly what we're talking about. Yes, there is uh, a good news. You see, this constitution has, was a long, long, long journey. And uh, I was even part of, uh, um, you know, one of the delegates um, on the, representing the church and some other uh, people uh, from the Catholic Church when we were really trying to prepare the formation of the new constitution. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, there seems to have been also other powers. Uh, from within the country? From, from without. From outside? From, out, from without, who I think had their own uh, interests and agendas and so on. And again, this must have been, must have affected even uh, some of the authorities and even some of the members. And that is why some of the issues that, uh, you know, really should not appear in that constitution, they yeah. are actually there. Without what having. issues are we talking about specifically? Well, for example, uh, you're talking about the issue about the, um, the, the dignity of life. Okay, the right to life. Right to life. We are talking about the family, okay, the, the, the issue of the, of the family. We are talking about the um, equality with regard to uh, religion and so on. Maybe if you can say, what is the difference in language between the old constitution with regard to right to life and what is the new language that has been placed in that is making this? Yes, I, I, I think with regard to the old constitution, it was quite clear that the, um, the issue of um, uh, abortion is not uh, kind of uh, permitted. Now, here they say abortion is not uh, permitted unless... The health of the mother. Yeah, unless the health of the mother or the decision of uh, the uh, medical expert, medical doctor and what have you. Now, we were very clear, even as a church, and we made it very, 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 very clear that, uh, look, when we are talking about the defense of uh, life, I don't think that, well, there are ways in which we can put loopholes. Because when those loopholes are put, then there are going to be ways in which somebody is going to enter and then begin exploit to them. exploit them and, and so on. That is why we were very, very opposed to this constitution. Because we said, if this, and then, for example, the question of the family. It is put in such a way that, well, then you can have um, uh, gay marriages, you can uh, uh, so the, the the traditional understanding of husband and wife yes. has been supplanted by exactly. some other understandings. Some of other family. understandings, and we were very very uncomfortable. And even up to now, we are still very uncomfortable. Then there was the question of of the including the Muslim law in the constitution. The Sharia is included. It's included, all right. Now then we are saying, excuse me, I mean, either we are equal, yes. all of us, and if that is uh, the case, then let the things be done in the same way. So we are saying, no, keep, uh, and, and particularly when it is being said that Kenya is a, a secular state. Yes. There should be a clear separation so between state and church. And, and, uh, and uh, religion, that, that was, it is there in, uh, in one of the articles. So, and that is why we actually told, the, and I remember saying it, on the 30th of June, that was before the referendum, and I told we, we were closing the year of the priests in the basilica in Nairobi. And when we finished that, in the end, I told the Christians, now, last point. As you very well know, we are now journeying towards the referendum. 
as your shepherds, we have told you that, well, yes, the Constitution has wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things, and it, we all need it, and so on. But unfortunately, there are all issues uh, that uh, if this Constitution passes the way it is, then this constitu uh, Constitution will have effects, in uh, negative effects in this uh, country. And so I explained to them, and I told them, so you know exactly what we have told you. And let none of you, tomorrow, when things don't go, when things begin kind of uh, hurting you, never say that you are never told. I said it clearly. openly and clearly. And, so, and that is now where we are finding ourselves. Mm. You mentioned other interests, external interests, and uh, yes. there was a Washington Times editorial. Yeah. Uh, which I would like to refer to because it stated uh, that the Government Accountability Office in yes. the United States released a report confirming the Obama ad administration meddling yes. in the drafting of okay. the controversial provisions of Kenya's constitution. Yes. Yes. According to the editorial, I quote, U.S. officials funneled 18 million in taxpayer cash to a number of groups, at least one of which openly worked to reverse the African country's ban on killing the unborn. Mm -hmm. Some U.S. congressmen contested that this violated a statute that prohibits the federal government for lobbying for or against yeah. abortion with foreign aid. What is your knowledge of this? Well, at least there was something that was put, I think, on, uh, on email. It was read and was seen in, the, um, in um, our secretariat and so on. And we said it. And we said, Really, if there is any respect of uh, the freedom of any nation, then its own decisions and the decision of its own people and so on need to be respected. Uh, respected but not be influenced through um, uh, this kind of uh, interest, giving the money. Because where did that money go? To whom did it go? Into a pocket. Yes. So, and, 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 and in order to kind of influence and kind of divert you know, the right direction, and then let the, 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 the nation uh, go into the wrong direction. At the end of the day, then, who, who suffers? It is the common, the is the common, common people. Man, the common people. And it makes we, you angry. Yes. It was very, very, very painful. But nevertheless, and I think I was in the front line saying, let, the, let this issue of the Constitution, let it be a Kenyan affair. Let it be a Kenyan affair. It is almost like a new colonialism. Yes. Let, let this be a Kenyan affair and so on. And let the interests of those others and so on, let them handle their own affairs and so on. The Catholic Church in Africa, to talk about a bit of the good news, yes. is growing. Yes. Uh, in Kenya also, is growing very well and yes. strong. Yes. What is your hope, if you will, for the Catholic Church and for um, particularly in this, uh, let's say, civic responsibility and education of Catholics in their civic responsibilities. I think that um, the, the, the church, for example, in Kenya, the church in, in Africa has come a long way, has really come a long way, being the fruit of the wonderful work that, has, that was done by our dear missionaries. When you go to the various areas where these people have been, in various dances, you will find tombs. And who are buried there, the great majority are the missionaries. These men and women who could have gone back when they were growing old, but they never did. As we look back now, we say, yes, so much has been done for us. So much was done for us. And I think now this is the time that we must show our gratitude, not just by saying, but by living authentically that faith that has been kind of planted among us. It is your responsibility. That is our responsibility. And the more we live authentically, then the more I think we are also saying thank you. This is now the challenge because, you know, there is the planting of the seed of faith, but also there is the other people who are planting other seeds of secularism, of materialism, of um, uh, um, diverse um, agendas, uh, agendas and so on. This, I think, is a challenge. We need to focus on deepening the 
self-understanding of our own people from the human point of view and from the spiritual point of view and from the vocational point of view. And for us to be able to do that, then I think it is important to pay particular attention to every category. If it is the children, let them kind of really be accompanied. If it is the young people, then let them also be accompanied because they are the target. They are the target. I still insist that it is very important that the mothers be really give, given a special attention. Because even they, they have their own uh, serious uh, uh, challenges and so on. And particularly when there is this um, move towards, you know, the, 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 the issues of abortion and what have you, if they can be helped to understand that they are the image of, of the love of God. Yeah. And if they can understand that and really defend it, then I think we'll have a wonderful environment. And Likewise, the, the men. And the fathers, I was just going to exactly. say, because yes. Eve had to stand next to Adam. Adam protected, yes. needed to protect yes. Eve. Yes, and particularly for men to kind of be convinced that they are image of the fatherhood of God. Right? Their wives call them the father of the children, and the children call them father, and so on. How wonderful it would be if everyone in that family is paid attention to and is able to live to the full his or her own identity and dignity. Your Eminence, thank you very much for having been with us today. I deeply appreciate it. It was an opportunity for me to talk not only to the Kenyans, but to talk to so many people in the world. And we asked them to pray for, uh, for Africa, to pray for Europe, to pray for the whole world. And so that whatever challenges we may be facing, we may not be defeated by the challenges. We are greater than the difficulties that come our way. And we are a universal church. And we are a universal church. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program. And if you would like to know more about the situation of Catholics in Africa, how you might be able to help, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.